coach, if you don't mind starting us off with uh, what you saw looking back on the film with the homecoming victory over Washington State, and then what you are looking forward to with this week's road trip to USC. Yeah, it was certainly a big win. I thought the guys competed well. You know, on offense, um, I guess we stayed persistent was a good word. We, you know, there were a couple times they they uh, did a good job, made us look bad, and then our guys stayed persistent, got a couple big plays, and defensively didn't really play well, but played hard and made just enough plays to to get us some key stops. And you know, it was certainly a big win, and now we have an even bigger game this weekend against one of the more talented teams in the country. So. Uh, made ourselves a little more relevant. You know, we're, in, we're entering November with a chance to still compete for the South Championship, and that's where we want to be. Bruce, that second play of the game where you guys went down the field to point Dexter through the ball deep, was that your decision? Was that Rod's decision? How do you think that maybe kind of changed the complexion of the game, considering they probably came in and weren't expecting you maybe to do something like that? Yeah, we knew we were going to, th- they're going to be. And they were aggressive from the start, bringing the safeties down and challenge us to throw the football a little bit. And, and uh, so I knew I was going to have to call more pass plays, call more deep shots, and take some chances a little bit. Uh, but uh, Khalil stole the ball well. We've got, we've got a good group of wide outs. We've protected well. Uh, but I, I expect we'll see more of it because we're going to play with 11 in our run game. You know, the safeties may line up deep, but they'll come down quickly, which theirs did, or they'll just go ahead and line up in there and say, come beat our corners or beat our safeties on the pass game. So Khalil um, has obviously been a very accurate passer, and you've talked about the touch that he has in the deep ball, but he wasn't this accurate last season when he played. What, what has changed from then to now as far as his development as, a, as his accuracy? Well, there's a little, yeah, certainly the second year in the system, so he knows the system a little bit better. The timing is is going to keep getting improved. I think as his career goes along, he'll the timing and uh, will continue to improve. I don't know if it was much, you know, throwing. We we've worked well on him throwing his motion, but he's had a great natural. Always had a great natural throwing motion. It's just understanding the offense and the timing of each each particular plays. I think that's what's overlooked a lot of times in the pass game is the timing that's involved, not only from a quarterback standpoint but from the receiver standpoint. And it's been good in a couple of the big plays in the last few weeks. After looking at the tape, what did you see defensively? It kind of seemed like it was all or nothing uh, with the defense, four interceptions and then 600 plus yards passing. Yeah, we, you know, we didn't, uh, the, 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 the thing that was the toughest for us is we did not affect the quarterback. That was what we thought one of the keys in the game was we had to get some pressure on a quarterback and not always with a five-man pressure, but even with some of our four-man pressures. And we didn't touch them. I don't think we touched them the whole game. and. And when you do that, you know, the quarterback, especially the, the system they have, is going to have a big day. And, you know, so we got to get better at our pass rush. we got to do more things to, to affect a quarterback first and foremost. Were you surprised they took out Luke Polk? I thought he was banged up. I saw him limping a little bit. Um, and the other guy, you know, Tyler came in and played phenomenal. And he could run a little bit too. So I don't know what behind that decision. But, it, I mean, both of them are really good players and uh, have had great, you know, Falk's had a tremendous career. So, so again, we, we just have to be able to generate more pressure. Rich, when you first came here, I guess part of the offensive philosophy was to run a lot of plays. Like you wanted to be that team that was up in the 85 to 95 range. Obviously now you're scoring a lot quicker and, and the play count is maybe like more in the 50s and 60s. Does that change the philosophy? Do you still want to be that team that runs a lot of plays or because you have now that quick strike available, availability, it doesn't necessarily need to be that way? Yeah, I mean, you're not going to tell the guy to get stop. Hey, you're running down there, JJ, wide open. You know, stop at the 20 and let's get about four more plays. You know, we've had more explosive plays, it seems like, in a four-game stretch than I can remember. So those are good. But inevitably, and then certainly both on the other side of the ball, too, we've got to get more three and outs. So uh, we've had to play a lot more plays defensively than offensively, and it's concerning. But... Um, you know, we're scoring, so that that's okay. But you know, one of the, the two stats I'll probably look at first and foremost are first downs, which is kind of out, was out of whack in that last game, and then number of plays, just so you know how, you know, if, you're, if fatigue is going to be a factor at all. And, and uh, thankfully we did. We are scoring a lot of big explosive plays because we're, we're having problems getting some three and outs. What do you think accounts for all those explosive plays besides the obvious Khalil factor? Well, is there anything else? Part part of this too is when you when you 
do put the safeties down and do play cover zero, if you can burst through the first or second level, then it bodes well for big plays. So you're taking a risk not just in the pass game but in the run game. If a guy doesn't fit right and you're bringing all 11 down in the box, if a guy doesn't fit right, then it tends to, to be, lead to big runs. And that's what's happened in, in some of these last few games. I hate to beat a dead horse, but um, you know, Khalil Tate's had a phenomenal four weeks. Uh, Pac-12 coverage seems to be a hot button topic for a lot of fans complaining about the late starts. Uh, what, is your, what are your thoughts on the fact that he's not getting as much exposure maybe nationally? That oh, I don't had? care about it. And Khalil, don't, I don't think neither one of us. I mean, the, the, I'll put it this way. I'll, when, when players get attention, that's a good thing. I'm, I'm happy for the players. It's happy for their families. I'm happy for the program. But that's way f so far down the list of things that are important. Um, you know, if you keep winning and doing well, people will notice. Uh, the late start thing, I just I wish we played earlier just so we can play earlier. <laughs> not not worried about the attention part of it, but uh, and, and Khalil's not either. He's worried about winning. Uh, you know, I just heard he was player of the week in the league. That's nice. You know, you get a you know a nice recognition for him and the family and for the program. But you know, all that other stuff is really uh, not in my thought. And I don't think it's any of our players' thoughts either. Obviously, um, we know what your feelings are about all the late starts. Mm -hmm. Probably know what our feelings are about the late starts. It's um, hard, isn't it, for your deadline? You're getting your yeah. stuff in, and it's especially there. in the print media. I mean, yeah. how do you do that so after midnight? Just from a logistical standpoint, though, what are the challenges that that presents to you once the game's over, into Sunday, et cetera, road game, home game? What are some of the challenges? Yeah, I think it's, it's you know, on the road, it's obviously a quick turnaround. You're getting back early in the morning on Sunday morning, and even at home, you're, it's – the turnaround so quick, and it's more in the athletes. When do they relax? You know, we we give them one day off, and for us, it's Mondays. Uh, they have classes and all that. And, you know, I thought about flipping it around and giving them Sunday off, but it's you know, it's a not a lot of rest time. And but it's that's what Pac-12 is. We all understand that. I've I don't know if anybody's played as many or as few, I should say, as play as few day games as we have over the last five or six years. I mean, somebody can probably look that up. But, you know, that's that's the way the schedule is. And TV exposure is nice, but it is tougher for you all, and it's tough sometimes on the fans for, for the late games at home and on the road. But in terms of, I mean, you, you say you don't care about exposure necessarily, but, I mean, bigger picture. Not to say I don't care about exposure. I say it's it's not – it's not on the list of things that I worry about on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. Yeah. I mean, exposure is good for all the programs, and um, particularly if you think it's going to be good exposure. You know, you want to be happy. You want to be happy for our guys to see that. And But it's, you know, that's where we're at um, with our television contracts, and uh, that's kind of probably where we're going to be at for a few years. Um, you're in the back in the top 25 for the first time since 2015. What, what does that mean for the program? Well, the, the relevancy part of it is was something we talked about quite a bit last week. We, you know, if you beat a ranked team and you're, you're in a position to be ranked, that's kind of neat. You know, it makes the next game more important as you go forward, and you want to be relevant more to, at the end of the year than the beginning of the year. So our guys have worked hard to get in that position, but you got to keep winning to stay there. From what you've seen, why don't you think? Sam Darnold has been as sharp as maybe what we saw towards the end of last year when he was really rolling. I don't know if he ha you say he hasn't been. I mean, I think there's the expectations were so high for a guy like Sam Darnold or Josh Rosen that if they don't throw for 400 and four or five touchdowns every game, somehow it's a letdown. I mean, Sam Darnold's still a, one of the best players in the country. He's still a first-round draft choice. And um, without no question in my mind, he needs to – Go ahead and declare for the draft. Maybe he'll do that before Saturday. <laughs> He's phenomenal. Going back to the exposure uh, element, do you think that's having a trickle-down effect with the, the home crowd? Uh, there's only 42,000 people here. and it seems like fans are leaving uh, earlier than normal. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know what the crowd was. It, you know, I'm, Selfishly, you want to sell out in every game. And we have um, a great sports city that loves athletics and, and all sports. and. We've always had tremendous support. Uh, you know, Zona's usually more crowded than that, too. Uh, and they've, but they're always good with the folks that are there. I didn't uh, – um, I guess I didn't pay much. I didn't know if people left because the game was pretty tight all the way to the end. If they did, then they missed the exciting moments at the end, you know, with an interception and 
for touchdowns, some other stuff. But we've got great support. I, I would, you know, every every coach, every football program wants to have a sell in every game, and I think, you know, the folks probably in town are like, okay, who is this Khalil Tate guy? And let's go watch those young guys play and compete. So hopefully we'll we'll sell it out for the next game. But we've always I've had great support here. We've had great support here for for five and a half years now. Um, Michael Elatis came into the game for a little while there. Was um, was that just wanting to get him in the game? Yeah, it was a shoe problem. Didn't you see that? Yeah, somebody, one of the big guys' shoe fell off. It, it happened twice. I don't know how that happens. I mean, they wear size 20. I mean, uh, their shoe fall off. And then it, then, it, then it takes like 20 minutes to put the shoe back on. I guess, you know, the, the big guys can't reach down there with their knee brace and tie their shoes or something. So maybe we need like Velcro instead of shoestrings on there. Uh, but yeah, that happened twice. It happened with, with uh, Alsadek who wears probably a size like 18, and then DeBeer, who wears like size 22 or something. So it took a while. I guess it takes longer to put on big shoes than it does little shoes. It seemed like LT did pretty well. There was a couple of the big plays happening when he was. Well, he's a tough guy. And he's a, um, I love the way he works. He's got a great attitude. There's nobody that eats more on his football team than Michael LT. But uh, and he's maintaining his weight. I always worry when he goes home because it's, you know, that was, Probably of all the home visits, I made a bunch of home visits. I don't know if there's ever been more food prepared for a couple of coaches on a home visit than the LT's family. But uh, he's going to be a good player, and he works hard. Love his attitude, and you know he's. We've stayed relatively healthy up front this year, but you know we have a couple guys in, in backup roles like Michael that that we think can play pretty good. I'm going to kick his diet soda habit. Is he telling you he's doing diet? Yeah, I think that he may be just saying that. I don't know if he's, I don't know if he's doing that or not. But yeah, he can eat a large quantities of food. It's I've never seen nothing like it. Uh, aside from the muffed punt, was this maybe the best overall special teams performance of the season? I know you had some punt return touchdowns, but as far as kickoffs, punting, the long field goal, all that. We're, stuff. Yeah, we're really solid. That was good. It was uh, 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 important for us to do that. I I still think we. You know, probably can do a little bit better in, in some of the returns. And then our punt block thing, we didn't get as much pressure on their punter. Uh, but it was a solid performance. You know, I thought Josh Pollock did a nice job punting as well as his field goals. And then Lucas, Lucas's thing was huge. And Lucas has been invaluable when we signed him. We thought, okay, if nothing else, he, he's going to give us a, a guy that can kick a lot of them out on the ends and you know, kickoffs. And he's done that. 50-plus yard field goal. Yeah, he made um, – it was last Sunday in our walkthrough, I think he made a – I think it was a 70-yarder because the guys were kind of playing around before the walkthrough started. And it was in that direction with a little bit of breeze, and he nailed it. And so when it was 57, uh, like, I, he, he got this. So he did. He nailed it. He kicked it. And their guy did one too. I mean, it was a 56-yarder. could have been good from 60-some. So, yeah, that was big momentum thing. But the return was just as big with TJ the, uh, right before that. What was the conversation like, uh, the decision-making process in your mind? To, to oh, what not? I, I, was, uh, I was talking with Coach Noor, and I said, you know, 56, 57, I think he got this. And he said, yeah. And then Lucas kind of nodded his head, and I'm like, oh, what? You know, the odds of making you so you compare a Hail Mary try to a guy making a 56, 57-yarder that's made him in practice every day, okay, the odds are better with the field goal. So that was neat. With a four-game win streak, what kind of impact are you seeing, feeling, hearing, and recruiting? Well, it has been a little uptick. Uh, this from guys answering phones quicker or texting us. And and um, certainly there's guys in Southern California that, that know about Cleo Tate. That's been – that's helped a little bit. But this – you know, we had, you know, some outstanding guys here this past weekend. And everybody – I know it's – you know, even though the games are late, you know, people see highlights, particularly when you play ranked teams. So I think that's helped. But uh, I know the the buzz around the coaches talking about is so-and-so. We talked to so-and-so. And, and uh, I don't know how many we're going to sign, but uh, we're going to have a lot more. We're having a lot more interest now all of a sudden. And it's, it was going well anyway. You know, we thought recruiting has gone went well last year, and that's showing up a little bit. And we think it's going really well this year too. What was the most important factor for you and just kind of how your team weathered that third quarter where you had the back-to-back -back turnovers and, and kind of pulled themselves out of that? 
Yeah, I don't think the the demeanor changed all in the um, at all during the game, and I don't think it's changed in any of the. We've been in a lot of tight games the last few weeks, and I don't think the demeanor has changed at all, which has been key. I think particularly when you have young guys, you worry about if they if they're going to panic if something goes bad or something they don't have the best moment or something like that. And I haven't seen any of that this season. Two games in a row now, Paul has done you know some big play interception knockdown. Does he read something that, that you haven't seen from a lot of freshmen? He just got a knack. I mean, he's he's a smart football player, and, and again, he's still learning the system. He's a true freshman, but some guys just have a knack for for the game and and uh, recognize things a little bit quicker. On the play he made for the interception was a was a tremendous play. They had thrown that route a couple times earlier, and we were a little bit late. And that time he recognized it. Uh, a little early. He's got great ball skills. I mean, he made a great catch, and, and then he, he was a running back in high school, so you could see his running skills. That was that was huge. And for us, if, if you're struggling defensively, whether it's a fourth down stop or batting a pass down or obviously getting an interception like that, some interceptions you're lucky. You know, ball bounces off a guy's hands. And some interceptions where you just have a guy make a great play. That was one where he just made a great play. A couple plays in a row with uh, Nunley. You guys ran that little seam, and it worked. What, uh, where does that come from, and what do you like about that? How about Jamie's per catch average? What is it, about 50-some yards throughout his career? Throughout his career, Jamie not only is averaging 50-some yards of, yards of catch, and so the, the common person will, why aren't you throwing to him more, right? <laughs> so uh, then that Jamie got an opportunity with Trevor being down. We were using uh, more two tight end sets with he and Bryce. And, you know, Jamie's he was a high school wideout. He's got good ball skills and can run. And uh, that's good. So if Trevor gets – Get back now. We got three guys that um, that, that we feel confident with tied in, and then all three have caught in a touchdown. Yes. See, for all you folks that have been clamoring to throw the ball to tied in, how many schools have three tied ends with touchdowns? Right, touchdown passes. Interesting stat. Look that up, Blair. Has anybody has that ever happened here before? You know, there you go. <laughs> Inquiring minds like myself want to know. You know, it's good. You guys have already played a Southern California team in UCLA, now USC, who's kind of the, the benchmark standard in the Pac-12. How, how much energy do you think the guys are going to have this week going into that game? They'll do, particularly guys from Southern California. They, you know, they all know each other. I know Khalil's got a couple teammates that play for them on defense. And, and, and so I think from that standpoint, for the Southern California guys, UCLA and USC are huge games for them because they know a lot of those guys. But, you know, for us, it's a – it's a team that was picked to win the league, a team that was picked to be in the playoff, and they're playing really good football. They they looked awesome um, Saturday night. So at their place, big time atmosphere, should be a lot of fun. What stands out most about Jones? Oh, he's a freak. I mean, athletically, you know, the way he can get to full speed, you know, there are backs, and we got some of them, JJ in particular, that gets to full speed in a hurry. He gets to full speed in a hurry, and his fast is fast, and he's a big physical guy. And, you know, when he's not out in there and they put somebody else in, it looks like the same dude. I mean, he's – but Jones has been – you know, I think he's one of the best in the country, not just in the league, but in the country, without question. Big uh, game, two ranked teams under the lights, L.A., national television. How, how do you expect all the you know, freshmen on the team to respond and, and look at that situation? Yeah, I think – I hope it's with excitement. That, and they're going to be nervousness too, but, you know, there's going to – I hope there's nervousness in all the games. But in this one, there is a big-time atmosphere. It's it's uh, against a, uh, a really good football team, one of the top most talented teams in the country. And – you know, with a lot at stake. So I want them to enjoy it. I think there was a little bounce in their step uh, Sunday night. I think we should have good practices and preparation, and we'll go out there and have some fun. You guys started Jarius Wallace um, at safety, and it seemed like he was around the ball kind of the whole night. What have you seen out of him? He has been. He, I've been really proud of the way he's competed. You know, essentially for us, he's a first-year player that that's getting and making the most of his opportunity. and. You know, it's uh, I mentioned earlier on a call that you know there's there's a lot of guys. You know, you mentioned obviously Cleo. He got an opportunity, he's making the most of it. Jamie Nunley, and then Zach, Zach Green, Jarius Wallace. You know, those guys are all getting a chance to come in, and all of a sudden you're you're seeing some special stuff out of them. And that you know, so when they're guys that they came in for get healthy, you know, we're a better football team. So when we get a couple guys healthy, all of a sudden Jarius, whether he starts or He's in a in a backup role. He'll play now because we got confidence in what he can do. You also were playing J.B. Brown 
a lot? Is he just someone who you think maybe can give you some pass rush? Yeah, a true freshman that uh, that's still learning. It gave us a little bit of lift there. Uh, we're we're always constantly looking for for pass rushers, and that's kind of what we we signed and recruited him as. Is he was a linebacker, but he was more of a pass rush guy, and. Um, that's, you know, as a true freshman, there's, he's going to get beat, bounced around a little bit, but he's going to be a good football player. Which have you kind of, obviously you've gotten all these big play touchdowns, a lot of uh, touchdowns on longer plays. How have you kind of assessed your red zone run game? You didn't get it in in the second quarter, but then you kind of changed up the formation there in the third quarter where you were able to get it in. How have you kind of evaluated that? I think we've been pretty good in the red zone. There's Anytime you get in some five, inside the five and don't score touchdowns, it's disappointing. And, you know, it's, as, as, as well as people can score, those three points sometimes look deflating, but it's still three points. But we've been, you know, for the most part, really efficient in the red zone, getting points. We've missed a couple field goals and and all that, but uh, we've uh, we've been pretty good with that as far as taking care of the football. And but you got to get touched to beat USC. We can't get threes inside the red zone. We're gonna have to try to get. Obviously, you're trying to get seven, but uh, the execution part of it. Uh, is always usually the issue, and that and the fact that they're going to outnumber you in the run game and put all 11 down in there. How do you process Khalil's interception in that game, knowing that it, you know maybe should have been a penalty on the play? I thought, yeah, the, on on the, I thought he got hit early. You know, so did so did uh, so did our receiver. And then watching film, there wasn't anything on film that changed my opinion on it. But those those bang bang plays are hard. I think sometimes, you know, that would probably cause a game to be too long. I would like you like for sometimes those plays to be reviewable. They're such big plays, but those are judgment calls. It's like holding. You know, what's and everything could be reviewed if that's the case. But uh, yeah, they're they're that the, probably the hardest thing for the officiating now, particularly for all the man coverage you're getting, are those. Is it at offensive pass interference? Is it not? You see, because you're seeing now so many of those critical calls and critical, I guess, one on one battles nowadays more than ever before, it seems like. Does that happen more now that the back shoulder throws has gotten more popular, you think? It's happened more now because of all the press man cover one, one on one battles that you have, I think, more than anything else. And then teams attacking it. You know, teams are saying, okay, we're going to go one on one, and if nothing else, we'll try to draw a flag. And you're you're seeing a lot of that on all levels. On, on college level, it's not at least like the pros, they mark it on the spot. At least colleges, it's just 15. But if it happens like in this game where it's a turnover, you know, those, those are tough judgment calls, I guess. Anything more for Coach? Yeah, do you have a good nickname for Khalil Tate? Because this has been like – a topic for the last week. Yeah, is that like is that like a standard protocol? Like if somebody's like going off the charts, you got to have a nickname for him. You know, that's okay. I mean, somebody's called him the big cat. He is kind of a big fella. Got a big head, you know. But um, no, I no, I'll let you all figure that out. He's he's he's. I haven't seen anything. You sometimes you'd worry about if a guy getting a lot of attention, is it gonna go to his head, so to speak? I haven't seen anything change in his demeanor. He's He's handled everything as about as well as you could hope to somebody that's had such a phenomenal four weeks, and I wouldn't expect anything different. Was something you came up with in practice? That you no, the things I've called him in practice are not. No, <laughs> no, we don't. We don't need to go there. Yeah, for sure. All right, thanks, everyone. Thanks okay. So